pool of London is like a leafless forest of masts and ropes, furled sails and rigging, all glistening wet with dew. Joseph Mallard William Turner, not yet Britain's greatest artist, portmanteau in hand, boards a Margate Hoy at Bear Quay. Perhaps it is the Francis under the command of Captain Goten, or the Diana under Captain Boxer. Once these flat-bottomed vessels carried goods in and out of the port, and passengers were additional. Now the human cargo is herded aboard like so much livestock, along with their baggage and hampers filled with food for the journey and bottles of liquid refreshment. In the summer of 1796, like any young man of 21, Turner was in love. Fresh from his success at the Royal Academy exhibition, where his first exhibited oil painting, Fisherman at Sea, had sold for £10, he set out for Margate intending to ask a girl to marry him. Though some Turner scholars have referred to the account of Turner's love life at this time as dubious, denying Turner a romantic side, we know that he had a strong connection with the town and travelled there many times throughout his life. From the age of ten, when his seven-year-old sister became ill and died, young William was often sent away from London to stay with his mother's relations, the Marshalls. First upriver to Brentford, then later downstream to school in Margate. The school, situated in the aptly named Love Lane, was run by a Methodist preacher by the name of Thomas Coleman. Whilst at this school, William became friends with Edward White. Edward had a sister, Elizabeth. Over the next few years, young William would fall in love, not only with the girl, but the town of Margate, returning many times. It may have been from these journeys to Margate that Turner developed his love of the sea. It was, of course, possible to take a coach journey from London to Margate. Joseph Farrington, the Royal Academician and diarist, records one such journey, taken the other way, Margate to London, in 1804. He boarded the coach in Margate at 5am and didn't arrive in Piccadilly until 7 in the evening. Before 1796, there was no direct coach service to Margate. It had been necessary to change at Canterbury. It was also a fairly expensive mode of travel, an inside seat costing as much as 26 shillings, about £140 in today's money. The journey by sea was far less expensive, which would have, have appealed to young Turner, never one to spend money unnecessarily. In 1796, many things were changing in Margate. Turner must have noticed these changes as a regular visitor. The Times edition for September the 30th, 1791, declared that Margate is becoming one of the most agreeable watering places in England and went on to describe an annual ball where there was a numerous assembly of the first people of rank and fashion. Perhaps not quite as fashionable as Bath or Brighton, the small town was certainly on the up. By September the 1st, 1804, the Times simply refers to Margate as this fashionable watering place and goes on to describe the crowds flocking there on the last weekend in August in spite of the ongoing threat of invasion by Napoleon's army from just across the Channel. 1796 was the year which saw the opening of the General Sea Bathing Infirmary in Margate by the Quaker physician John Coakley Letson. Letson's infirmary was intended for the treatment of the poor who suffered from scrofula or tuberculosis. Sea bathing had become increasingly fashionable during the 18th century and was thought to be a treatment for all sorts of medical conditions, as well as generally beneficial to health. By the mid-1790s, it was all the rage for people from all walks of life. Turner's fellow passengers would have been a mixed crowd of merry folks, 
cooks and tailors and butchers and market traders, perhaps a schoolmistress and her cousin from Bromley, a curate, a dissenting minister, a watchmaker from Hampstead, or a Phoenix Fire Office agent by the name of Bassett on his way home, all taking the passage to Margate, all clambering aboard regardless of state. As one observer noted, a passage in a Margate hoy, like the grave, levels all distinctions. The high and low, the rich and poor, the sick and sound, the gentleman and the blackguard, are all jumbled together. By 1796, there were only three of the old-style hoys still making the trip. Boat operators had been quick to spot the opportunity to provide a supposedly more genteel service for a more genteel fare. The cheapest fare aboard a hoy was around five shillings in 1796. It had doubled in five years. But for ten shillings, one could take a passage in an indoor cabin aboard a packet boat from Dice Quay, Billingsgate Dock. The packet boats were essentially the same type of river-going vessel as the hoy, but they'd been fitted out expressly for passengers. Gone was the hold filled with sacks of grain. Now the passenger, for a few extra shillings, could travel in the comfort of their own cabin, sheltered from the elements, if not from the effects of seasickness. Turner would not have wanted an inside cabin. The artist who claimed to have been tied to a ship's mast during a storm would have wanted to see as much of the river, with all its bustling activity, and the sea, with its many different vessels, as possible. It is thought that Turner had two sketchbooks with him on that journey in 1796. The first is known as the Wilson sketchbook, because it contains a number of sketches taken from the works of artist Richard Wilson. The Wilson sketchbook also contains numerous river and coastal views, as well as studies of clouds and farm animals. One can gain a good idea of the kinds of scenes Turner observed on his journey. But the most striking sketches appear in the ske second sketchbook Turner had with him. Known as the Studies Near Brighton sketchbook, this sketchbook is remarkable for its many blank pages. However, buried amongst these many blank pages are two sketches done aboard a boat. They are catalogued as part of the deck of a packet boat with seated passengers and figures on the deck of a sailing packet. Are these scenes aboard the Margate Hoy? Though Turner scholars have not at this time identified these sketches definitively as the Margate Hoy, a sketch of 1808 by Turner's contemporary Joseph Clarendon Smith bears a remarkable similarity to the Turner sketches. The passage to Margate was often hindered by the weather, affecting the length and comfort of the journey. The Times, for the 16th of September 1797, reported that so great is the rage for watering places that the Margate packet had, the week before last, 152 passengers on board who were 27 hours on their passage. During the greater part of the time, it rained so as to drive them under deck and made them as comfortable as the people in the black hole of Calcutta. Margate Harbour from the Sea is drawn across two pages of the Wilson sketchbook. Executed in gush, pencil and watercolour on paper prepared with a red-brown wash. It shows the panorama of Margate Harbour from the cliffs to the left to the town on the right. The end of the stone pier dominates the centre of the drawing, with the light falling strongly on the right, indicating that sun was in the southeast, so it was probably drawn in the early evening. Moments later the hoy would dock at Margate and Turner would have joined the scramble to get ashore where a thousand persons of all distinctions indiscriminately blended together. 
and young Mr Turner would have disappeared into the crowd, off to find his lodgings. The heyday of the Margit Hoy was relatively short-lived. By 1815, sail had given way to steam and the journey became much quicker and more reliable. Charles Lamb wrote his romantic and no doubt nostalgic essay to the old Margate Hoy in 1823, where he complained that the steamers were poisoning the breath of the ocean with sulphurous smoke. It would seem that the people of the period were as nostalgic for sail as the people of today are for steam. It was probably these early trips under sail that inspired Turner's love of the sea and of ships and boats of all types and made the master of landscape painting also the greatest marine painter of his generation.